Hi. Oh, how's it going, guys? So oh, I'm really happy to be here. I came from Brazil, it's other side of the world. Let's just connect to my cell phone. This talk, actually, I am Eric. I am Google Developer Expert and Microsoft MVP. Just because I share content is not because I'm a specialist, nothing like that. In my talk today, I will try to, to show you some reasons to use Kubernetes and Node.js and Docker. We will make some uh, point of view about Docker and how we can create real faster application or scale our applications. To start that, we will start talking about Node.js. So Node.js is a JS Congress, so we talk about Node.js. I will show a few examples about Node.js, but with these chips you could use in any application. If you are Java developer, Office Sharp developer, if it's in Docker, it's the same for everyone. First, we have this bunch of code, but let's just see that. So the first thing that we have to change in our legacy application when we are moving to Docker is this uh, variables, or this static values. So if I need, in this case, to change it to a development environment or a production environment, it's so hard. Sometimes I have to compile my code and change the string, and then I have to move at all. In this case, I will get these values, and I will change for environment variables. So we have now the process.env and make at all. But sometimes, Sometimes this is really a static thing, so you make sure you could choose if it's better to you choose or not. It's just some advices to make that. And I will talk, I think for me, I'm loving with Docker. So Docker, how many of you is working with Docker? Oh, Docker is really nice. I think because I work with developers, I am a developer, and we have the, the common phrase is if you it's working only on my machine. It's not working in production. So my machine works. No, with Docker now, I can create an uh, isolated environment. I can make my dependencies. And I can show for my internship what my, my project really needs to run in these machines. In my point of view, this Docker is just a big operational system, or we have uh, actually our operational system, and we have a small operational system that is our own application. So we can move our uh, Linux inside that, we can have our applications, we, uh, we have isolated memory, CPU, inside this small box. So for me, it's really nice to do that. And our application inside Docker is just a container. So they have their own binaries, their own uh, dependencies inside it. And it's, I think it's the best point of RAW. When I have to move my application to other server, I have a lot of reasons to do not that. So the first one is, what is my application really needs? So what dependencies, what I have to install to my application? Working with Docker, we have a receipt file that we define the steps, and when I have a new developer in the team, this developer could see which steps they have to make to run this application. And the security point of view, we have our VM, and in this case, I bring a WordPress because it's a common scenario, and we have a shared server. In this case, my shared server is exposing to the world, and I have one WordPress for each customer. So when one customer tries to access, they have your own application. But sometimes I have a WordPress or application that has some word, uh, deprecated version of plugins. And I have a bad guy that we have in any applications or any production environments. This bad guy could enter inside this WordPress and go through about your infrastructure. He can know which is running in your operational system, and he can retrieve information. Or worse, he can just delete everything for your application. So yeah, it's really bad in this case. But using Docker, we have now my isolated box. So inside this, if I have a deprecated version, this deprecated version, this guy just could access only this operational system and these problems. But 
he knows now, okay, I can't access the other instances, but I can make a the DDL servers attack. So I can attack your application. When they attack this application, the application is just down. So I have to enter in my virtual machine and then change my code to that. And when my customer tries to access, they just can't access their application. So working only with Docker with nothing to manage Docker, we have some problems. So if something happens, we have to change manually. We have to restart. We have to update manually. When we have to update this application, the timeout or the downtime is smaller than a traditional approach working on FTP update or other updates. But I have to stop my Docker and then start other instance. And this few time, this piece of time, the customers will deny the access. So yeah, it's not really good. And if you have over-processing, it's really hard for, to manage that. We have to install plugins, we have to install other things to manage that. It's really, really thing. But OK, when we're working on Dockerflow, OK, resolve a lot of things. But maybe I have to think in something more. So we have. We need more to manage our containers. So let me present you the Kubernetes. The Kubernetes is our orchestration platform that you use to manage Docker containers or other containers runtime. This is kindly called by Key8. A lot of people don't know about the Key8, but the Key8 is just the words. And this is really nice to manage our application. We will see. Some features, we have a lot of features, but we have only a few time to talk about it. So what we can do using Kubernetes? So the first, I think, is really nice because we can install the Kubernetes on the Raspberry Pi, on the, the server, the old server in my home or my PC, everywhere I can install. I can control and perform automated uh, updates. So if something's wrong, I can make health checks or check if my application is still running or if everything continues running in my process. And if it's not, just make a rollback of my application. And load balancer automatically and health checks. We can define some routes to ping up for our application and Kubernetes could ping our application in, a, in several times to know if it is running or not. If it's not running, they can queue our container and then up other new. So it's really, really good. I will talk about the components. So we have a lot of components, but these cases for me is what we use in production. It's really, no, it's really good to know if you work it. So we have a master node. So we don't run ever uh, containers inside that. We have a machine that will manage other machines. So we have the control plane of our application. Then we have some components inside our master VM. So we have the cluster store, all of the information of our cluster, on where is the nodes, where is the VMs inside our application. We'll manage that. We have a front-end CLI that we can create new applications, we can manage, we can replicate our applications inside that, or choose which is the best VM to receive our application. We have the scheduler. This is scheduler, we can route our application. So some, something is wrong with one VM, this application will be routed to other VM, and my application will still running after that. And we have the controller. So we have node controller, we have replication controller to see if the VM is working and to see if the count, the number of instances is, is still I defined. And we have the node. The node is properly our VMs in our cluster. So inside the node, we have the kubelet. So the kubelet makes sure that all containers we run correctly inside our cluster. And we have the container runtime. So in our case, it's Docker, but could be other runtime too. Yeah, I did know that we have other container runtime, but yeah, we have maybe three or four. And we have the network proxy. So inside our node, we can use services to define our DNS. We can define uh, our IP to talk with each other application. It's really Powerful. And we have the small piece of our application. We have the pods. 
In this case, my application, my NGINX uh, instance or my WordPress will be a pod, and I can target, I can create labels to expose only a few containers. In this case, oh, I need to expose to the world only the pod that has a label called my production. And then I need to perform an update, but I'm not sure about this update. So I will expose only the pod with the version 2, and we can create a lot of targets using that. I can expose, I can modify only using these labels. It's really nice. And we have desired state and current state. So the desired state is a great concept in Kubernetes. So imagine we have our master node. Inside this master node, we can create a manifest file. And this manifest file could be JSON or YAML. So if, yeah, we are JavaScript developers. I think JSON could be better to create instances and use that. And we define, oh, I need three instances of my Nginx. And I have actually three VMs. So the Kubernetes will make the balancing and change one application for each VM. In this case, I, my desired state is three instances of Nginx, and my current state is three, current, three Nginx. But if my node dies, the Kubernetes will move, will use the scheduler to get this container input in other VM, and my current state is really cool. Now, I don't have worries about that. If some VM dies in the middle of the process, I can manage that, but my application is still running. I have no problem with that. And a common problem, a common mistake of developers starting with Kubernetes is the communication between applications. So in this case, I think, oh, I am a smart guy. I don't need a load balancer. So I have four applications. And I have two databases, so I will show two databases to one, two applications to one database and two to other. But if one database just died, I half of my infrastructure is down now. So yeah, it's not so smart uh, choice to make. In this case, we created a layer called by serves and they provide a network. So I can, I can call my services by a DNS, and if I need more instances of database, or if I need more instances of my containers, it's just move and add more, but this service is still the same. So which is really nice, it's really nice. And deployment, I think when we go back, we will try the Kubernetes, and we have to see the deployment. So deployment, when we see uh, the tutorials or things about Kubernetes, we have a lot of components, but deployment for me is one of the best. Inside the deployment, we can define how many replicas we have, how the pods will be, how is the labels, how much the processing could execute, and we can define which is the node target. So sometimes with log applications, I can move one specific application to one specific node, and I can make using services. So yeah, sometimes, oh Jesus, a lot of concepts about Kubernetes, but it's really nice to know. Now, how do I start with Kubernetes? So in my opinion, we can start using at least two VMs, one for master, one for node. We can use on Raspberry Pi, or use installing my services, or just use some, uh, some platform, last Azure or DigitalOcean or Google Cloud, all of them has application like that, and we have to need a Docker registry, public or private. So welcome to Docker images. So never mind to copy and paste files to production anymore. Now we work with images, and I don't need to know which application is. I know that is a Docker image. To start, I will create a Docker file. It's a simple Node.js Docker file. I have the steps to create my application. So first, I have to install my TypeScript. I have to install my Node.js dependencies. And then I have to run my application. After that, I will build my application. So I will build, I will make these steps, but 
in this time, I just build in my image, put in the side, and then I can distribute later. With this image prepared, we can create it, we can upload this image to my Docker Hub or your private Docker registry. In this case, we will up this image, and my cluster could be in any side of the world. So it's just I have a repository, and I will download this image to my cluster, and then everything will happen really first. So to run first our container, we could run a CLI. So it's just like a Docker run, it's a Kubernetes run. I pass my image, where is the port that will run, and I could pass to how many replicas this application will have. And then my application is now running. So it's really, really fast to run applications inside Kubernetes because I just download the images. So it's some reasons. I think in real, real side, in production environments, we know nothing is really simple that looks like. But in my opinion, the Update strategy is one of the most popular things or most funny things to create or to use in Kubernetes. So now I have 10 instances running in production, but now I need to update them. So I will just up, up them by a rolling update strategy. So I will up in my containers gradually. So just I have 10. When I will up a new version, I will kill one active and I will up one more. I will kill an active, and then one more. With this case, I have 100% of availability, so it's really nice. And it's scaling on demand, so sometimes I don't need hundreds of machines, or I don't need hundreds of instances. I need to, to that my system was a really smart system, so I don't need to change any time. Using Kubernetes, we can define some parameters inside your configurations to make this available. So if my application reaches maybe 20% of processing, I need to up three new more instances. Is this is really cool. And multi strategy So sometimes we know some problems. So our people is putting all of the applications in the same place, and when this region dies, just has our application down. So the cool thing is put a great strategy and put the VMs in other sites you don't have problems. And for us developer, we have infrastructure as a code. So we created a file, a manifest file that we define our code. And then if something happens to our cluster, if you have to create an our cluster, it just run one command and my VMs and my services is in, so it's really nice. I really love this. And some shortcuts, I think this is the point of this talk, I think. If you know Kubernetes, maybe you don't know these concepts, or you know, but share with the friends later too. Use liveness and readiness probe. So these configurations is to know how our application is running, or if your application is still running. Kubernetes is not so smart, so I up in my containers, but sometimes I have to wait for my connections, I have to connect with database, I have to connect to my customers, APIs, and then I have to wait some time. So in this code, I have the readiness probe, and the readiness probe will say, oh, are you ready to receive requests? So I will pass my health route, and this, this route we say we will return true or false if it is running or not. So in this case, it's really nice. But sometimes I have to wait some time to think, oh, OK, I, I can't receive a request yet because I, I spend maybe five seconds or two seconds to connect to other database or to finish my startup process. And if my application don't return result in two seconds, I know that something is wrong and stop the process. And we have the liveness probe. The liveness probe, the difference is I used to live. So if my application is already running, but I have some intermittent problem, the Kubernetes will make some things and to 
check if my application is still running. If it's not running, the Kubernetes will kill this application and will up a new instance. And sometimes we don't know what's happened, just the Kubernetes action about our code. And use external storage. So we know sometimes using VMs or sometimes using services, we, know, we don't know what could happen, but our data has to be safe. So you could link your application with uh, S3 or Azure Blob Storage and could make your, your life happier because something happens, your data is still live. So with these chips, I think you become a hacker, man. We can see how to, to still, how to make a Kubernetes cluster or when you can create an, uh, a Kubernetes cluster, what you have to pay attention more in your container. So thank you so much, everyone. I, I really have to be here. Yeah, thank you. This is my contacts, man. If you want to talk to me, reach me on Twitter or everywhere. This barcode, you can see the presentation and the GIFs. Oh. OK, thank you so much again.